Excellent. Well, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this virtual meeting of the Legislative Commission. We are going to begin with our roll call. So, Madam Secretary, if you could please call the roll. Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Assemblywoman Carlton. I'm here. I'm here. Thank you, Senator Hammond. Speaker Frierson. Here. Assemblywoman Krasner. Here. Assemblyman Wheeler. Here. Assemblyman Yeager. Here. Senator Dennis. Here. Senator Hammond. Here. Senator Hardy. Here. Senator Settlemeyer. Here. Vice Chair Raddy. Here. Chair Canazaro. Here. Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. I believe you have 11 members present. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'm sure Assemblywoman will be joining us here just momentarily. Um, we will go over just a couple of housekeeping matters as quick reminders for our meetings. Um, of course, anyone who is going to testify, if you could please state and spell your name for the record before, your te before you testify so that we can identify you and know who is speaking. Additionally, for anyone who would like to receive a copy of the Commission's agenda, minutes, or reports, you can be added to our mailing list by following the links on the website of the Nevada Legislature or by providing information to our staff. Contact information for staff is also listed on the website. In addition, we do accept written comments, which may be emailed or mailed before, during, or after the meeting, and that information can be added to all of our um, minutes for this particular meeting as well. The information regarding where to send written comments is on the website and listed on the agenda for this meeting as well. So we would encourage anyone who has additional comments um, or would like to submit any written comments to go ahead and uh, give those to us in written form. We will move on to um, item number two. This will be our first uh, period of public comment. Uh, the next, that is the next item that we have up. And so for those of you who have called in and would like to speak during this part of the meeting, this will be your chance to do so. Um, as a reminder, we do have some regulations that are on for consideration today. Um, aside from the agencies who will be presenting those regulations, if anybody else wishes to give testimony regarding those regulations, now would be the time to do so. So if that's what you are here to let us know about, um, go ahead and call in so that we can get your testimony. Um, once you are called in and waiting to speak for this part of our meeting, you'll be notified by our broadcast production services once you've been connected and when it is your turn to speak. Please remember that as usual, we will be keeping these comments to two minutes per person. So I may interrupt you to let you know that you've reached that point and ask you to go ahead and finish up. And of course, again, as I mentioned, you are always welcome to submit any additional comments in writing and we'll add those to the record for this meeting. We will also be having a second period of public comment. So if you prefer to wait and speak until later, you can always join us for that second period of public comment that will come at the end of the meeting. I'm now gonna turn this over to our staff from Broadcast Production Services to go ahead and queue up anyone who is calling in to speak and a member of our BPS staff will inform you when it is your turn to speak. So just pay attention if you are waiting on the line. Thank you, Chair. Would the caller with the last three digits of 853, please press star six to unmute yourself and slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and you may begin now. Um, <clears throat> good morning, uh, Doug Unger, U-N-G-E-R, Southern Nevada Government Affairs, Nevada Faculty Alliance and member UNLV Employee Benefits Advisory Committee <clears throat> for the record. Thank you to Chair Canazaro and the members of this commission for your service today. We were surprised uh, last evening by the packet for agenda item 6B, 
and the specifics of the interim study of the feasibility, viability, and design of a public health care insurance plan for Nevada, which we see as possibly advocating a short-term solution to a long-term problem, how to create a public option for uninsured Nevadans by, in the short term, shifting high costs and high-risk patient pools onto the back of Nevada State employees and their PEB health plans. Faculty in our state and state employees are facing already drastically reduced benefits and higher costs in proposed new plan designs to meet the state budget crisis. And this study, if the piggyback on the PEB proposal goes forward, would further increase financial burdens to state employees with almost certain additional benefit cuts, which we view as unacceptable. Furthermore, we do not see the Manit study as accurately reflecting the real costs of this proposal. With the certain $9 million to the state predicted, there is no accurate accounting for the increased staffing that PEB would need on top of that, nor the organizational upheaval such a proposal would inflict on our health care and benefits administration. The long-term solution is to address the urgent provider shortages and the outrageously high cost of medical care in northern and rural Nevada. Why does a hip surgery cost $20,000 in Reno and $80,000 or more in Elko? Addressing this issue is going to take much more strategic planning. And we believe innovative investments in the UNR and UNLV medical school clinical practices and rural outreach incentives and programs to address the provider shortages in the underserved regions of our state. In sum, we don't believe proposing to solve this problem on the backs of Nevada State employees is the right approach, especially during or while we're all hopefully recovering from a pandemic. We appreciate the concept, but the short-term solution in this proposal falls far too short at the expense of state employees who really cannot shoulder any more than we're already bearing. Thank you very much. Would the caller with the last three digits, 837, press star six now to unmute yourself and slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and you may begin now. Good morning, Chair Canisaro, Vice Chair Roddy, and Commission members. Kent Urban, E-R-B-I-N, for the State Nevada Faculty Alliance, the independent statewide association of NC faculty. We work to empower faculty to be wholly engaged in our mission to help students succeed. Part of the empowerment of faculty is to have a robust and fiscally stable healthcare benefits package that helps NC and the state attract high and retain high quality employees. While we generally support expansion of public health care options, we do have concerns and questions about the public PEB option in the Manit report. I won't repeat the comments, just say ditto to uh, Professor Doug Unger's comments about the high risk and higher cost if public participants who will likely be older and more rural with higher cost are added to the PEB pool. I would like to point out that if, on the other hand, the option is used to place public participants in a separate risk pool, then their costs will be higher, reflecting that older and more rural population. That is similar to what was allowed to occur in the mid-2000s by allowing non-state public retirees to join PEB. That created a decades-long death spiral of the infamous PEB retiree orphans. That mistake was finally corrected in 2017 in the 2017 legislative session, but at a great short-term cost to the state and a greater long-term cost shift to local government entities. We need to learn from the past and not repeat that mistake. Finally, the report states that the PEB plan is equivalent to a gold plan on the Silver State Health Exchange. Actually, with the plan benefits reductions approved by PEB in November, the base high deductible plan has been reduced at PEB, has been reduced to a silver plan at a higher cost. That will change any modeling projections. We will closely follow any legislative action on the public health care option as we move forward. Thank you very much. 
Madam Chair, at this time there are no more callers in public comment. We are going to move to the next item on our agenda, which is item number three, the Legislative Commission policy. Um, we do have Mr. Fernley here with us to help us work through the administrative regulations that are before us for our consideration. And so we'll begin with item number A, which is a request by the Director of the Office of Public Safety to continue a regulation not adopted within two years after submission to the Legislative Council. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Brian to go ahead and present that request uh, to all of us. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, as you um, may have uh, remembered from the last couple of meetings, um, under uh, within two years after the date on which um, they uh, are submitted to the Legislative Council for drafting, um, this request um, was not adopted within two years um, after submission to the Legislative Council for drafting. So um, by statute, the executive head of the agency is required to appear before the Legislative Commission and, and explain uh, the reason that it wasn't adopted within two years. Um, if the Legislative Commission approves moving uh, forward with the regulation um, uh, and to allow the adoption um, after that two-year period, um, then the uh, regulation would be considered for approval under the next agenda item. So this, um, this request is to allow them to adopt the regulation um, out, outside of that two year period. And then under the next agenda item, they would um, uh, adopt, the Legislative Commission would consider adoption of the regulation. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, any questions or comments from members of the commission? as to the um, request to continue that regulation. Move to approve. We do have a motion from Senator Hardy to approve the request to um, continue the regulation um, and to consider it for acceptance or denial. And I have a second from Senator Ratty. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, if you could please call the roll. Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Yes. Assemblywoman Carlton. Yes. Speaker Frierson. Yes. Assemblywoman Krasner. Yes. Assemblyman Weber. Assemblyman Wheeler. Here. And were you in favor of approving the continuance? Yes. Thank you, sir. Assemblyman Yeager? Yes. Senator Dennis? Yes. Senator Hammond? Yes. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Kettlemeyer? Yes. Vice Chair Rowdy? Yes. Chair Canazaro? Yes. You have 12 votes in favor. Great. The motion is approved, and we will consider that regulation um, under our next agenda item, which is item number 3B, review of administrative regulations submitted pursuant to NRS 233B.067. We have those regulations that are included in our meeting packet. You can access them online, and all commission members do have copies of those as well. These are regulations that have been adopted since our last meeting in December. And as is the usual method, I will go ahead and ask members to identify any regulations that they wish to have some additional questions answered on or, or some additional conversation about. We will hold those for discussion and then we will vote to approve any remaining regulations. Um, after that, we will go back through the regulations that have been asked to be held and ask that the agency that adopted that regulation uh, go ahead and address any questions related to that regulation and then individually we'll take votes on each of those as we move through them. So I will like to begin by asking any of the members of the commission if there are any regulations which they wish to have pulled for some additional consideration. Nothing on our side, Madam Chair. 
right. I am not seeing anything, which might be the first time this has happened since I've been here with all of you. Um, so luckily a, a pretty short list of um, of regulations. So with that, then we will take a motion to approve the regulations um, in total that have been submitted to us for consideration today. Um, I do see a motion from Senator Ratty. Is there a second from second. Senator Ryerson? Um, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, Madam Secretary, if you could please take the roll call vote. Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson. Yes. Assemblywoman Carlton. Yes. Speaker Frierson. Yes. Assemblywoman Krasner. Yes. Assemblyman Wheeler. Yes. Assemblyman Yeager. Yes. Senator Dennis. Yes. Senator Hammond. Yes. Senator Hardy. Yes. Senator Sotomayor. Yes. Vice Chair Ratty. Yes. And Chair Canazaro. Yes. You have 12 votes in favor. Fantastic. Those reg the motion has been um, the motion has been approved and those regulations have been um, included in our agenda and meeting packets will be adopted. We'll move on to item number four, which is approval of the 120 day calendar for the 2021 legislative session. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Erdos to go ahead and present the draft 120 day calendar for our consideration. Ms. Erdos, whenever you are ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the uh, 120 day calendar draft is uh, in the meeting materials. And um, what the draft that you have uh, in those materials is actually um, taking the the 2019 calendar and just moving it um, back to the dates to, to account for starting on February 1st. Um, and I think that there are some changes that you may um, wish to make and I'm gonna um, turn this over to um, Sarah Kaufman. The, the main thing that's driving part of this is that um, Russell Gindin uh, has asked to move the economic forum date from uh, April 28th to um, May 4th. And um, that's, the, that's within the statutory authority to do um, if you want to. And then um, we're also suggesting, I think that you move the um, start resolving budgets date that's on the 30th to May 3rd. And I believe there's another change um, that Sarah may want to um, present as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Sarah Kaufman, uh, Legislative Council Bureau. Uh, thank you, Ms. Erdos. Yes, uh, I would uh, propose also uh, moving the uh, finished budget differences date. Uh, currently, it is identified as May 20th to May 15th. Uh, the uh, Fiscal Analysis Division uh, provides for a balancing weekend um, that needs to be conducted and then uh, one week is needed to prepare the money bills. And so that would put us out to about uh, May 21st, 22nd. And then after all of those bills um, are then um, uh, dropped, there's the other appropriation bills that usually require at least another uh, week's worth of um, consideration. Um, I, I would also um, recommend uh, moving the uh, subcommittee start meeting jointly date from February 5th to February 4th. I don't think there are any other changes that I know of um, that have been suggested, at least to me, um, to the calendar. If you want to consider the changes that we've um, provided so far. Absolutely. Um, so first I'll ask if any members of the commission have any questions regarding the proposed uh, calendar or the recommended changes. 
I am not seeing any. Um, is there a motion to then, we would move to then approve the 120 day calendar with the recommended uh, changes as suggested by Ms. Erdos and Ms. Kaufman? So moved, Madam Chair. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Carlton and I saw a second from Senator Hardy. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, Madam Secretary, if you could please go ahead and call the roll call vote. Assemblywoman Mrs. Thompson? Yes. Assemblywoman Carlton? Yes. Speaker Frierson? Yes. Assemblywoman Krasner? Yes. Assemblyman Wheeler? Yes. Assemblyman Yeager? Yes. Senator Dennis? Yes. Senator Hammond? Yes. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Sotomayor? Yes. Vice Chair Ratty? Yes. Chair Canizaro? Yes. You have 12 votes in favor. The motion is approved and that will be our 120 day calendar for the 2021 session um, with those changes as suggested. We will move on to the next item on our agenda, which is item number five, reports of litigation. And we do have a litigation report to be presented by Kevin Powers. So Mr. Powers, we will turn it over to you and uh, let you go ahead and give us that report. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Kevin Powers, General Counsel, LCB Legal Division. I will be presenting today by audio only. I do not have a proper video connection at the time. We have two cases on two general areas of cases to report to the Legislative Commission today. The first will be agenda items 5A and 5B. 5A is Nevada Policy Research Institute versus Canizaro, in, which began in the 8th Judicial District Court in Clark County. And agenda item 5B is State of Nevada versus 8th Judicial District Court, Plumlee, which is in the Nevada Supreme Court, and also State of Nevada versus 8th Judicial District Court, Moen, which is also in the Nevada Supreme Court. In these cases, the issue is whether state legislators are prohibited by the separation of powers provision in Article 3, Section 1 of the Nevada Constitution from holding positions of public employment with the state executive branch or with local governments. At its meeting on September 18, 2020, the Legislative Commission directed the General Counsel and the Legal Division to take all actions that are necessary for the legislature to appear in, commence, prosecute, defend, or intervene in the MPRI action and any other related, associated, or similar actions or proceedings, including without limitation any appeals, any petitions or applications for extraordinary writs, or any other appellate review or relief of any kind. Now, the MPRI action, as I mentioned, was commenced in the 8th Judicial District Court against a number of individual legislator defendants. On December 28, 2020, the District Court dismissed the lawsuit and entered a final judgment in favor of all legislator defendants based on MPRI's lack of standing to bring its constitutional claims. On January 8, 2021, MPRI filed its notice of appeal with the Nevada Supreme Court and is appealing the district court's dismissal based on its lack of standing. Uh, the Nevada Supreme Court has not docketed the case yet, so we do not have a Nevada Supreme Court case number, but that docketing should occur most likely this week. Now, the other two cases are currently pending in the Nevada Supreme Court. That's the uh, Plumlee and Mullen cases. In each of those cases, the district court entered substantively similar orders, concluding that a member of the legislature who also holds a position of public employment with a local government as a deputy district attorney violates the separation of powers provision in Article 3, Section 1 of the Nevada Constitution. Because these cases raise the exact separation of powers issue that the Legislative Commission authorized the LCB Legal Division to deal with in any um, related or similar cases. On July 19th, 2021, LCB Legal filed a motion for an extension of time to file an amicus brief and to uh, also file a suggestion for consolidation and en banc consideration of these two cases, Plumlee and Mullen. So the point here is that the LCB Legal Division will be uh, providing 
its amicus brief when authorized by the court in order to argue that the separation of powers provision does not prohibit legislators from serving in positions of public employment with the state executive branch or with local governments. The next report on the agenda is agenda item 5C, and that is the consolidated cases Lander County versus State of Nevada, which is in the first judicial district court in Carson City, and Nevada Gold Mines versus State of Nevada, also consolidated in the first judicial court district court in Carson City. These consolidated cases involve the three joint resolutions proposing constitutional amendments that were passed by the legislature during the 32nd special session. Those resolutions were SJR1, AJR1, and AJR2. Each of those resolutions proposed revising provisions of the Nevada Constitution relating to the taxation of mines, mining claims, and extracted minerals. On January 14th, 2021, the district court held a hearing and took oral arguments from the parties on their respective uh, briefs and arguments with regard to the constitutionality of the three joint resolutions. In addition, issues with regard to standing, ripeness, and non-justiciability under the political question doctrine were argued by the parties as well. The district court took the matter under advisement. It is anticipated the district court will issue an order in this case within the next two weeks. And that is the litigation report for this legislative commission meeting, Madam Chair. I'm certainly open to any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Powers. We appreciate it. I will next ask if I can get my mic here. Um, I will next ask if anyone has any questions for Mr. Powers regarding the um, presentation on litigation. Okay, I'm not seeing any. So thank you again, Mr. Powers, for your report. And we are going to go ahead and move on to the next item on our agenda. It is item number six, reports of certain 2019-2020 interim committees to the Legislative Commission. We do have several reports of the listed statutory committees and interim studies included on our agenda and you can all follow along with those as we go through them. I have a request to take um, one of those reports out of order, um, the report on the Committee on Healthcare first. We do have Assemblywoman Cohen who is going to help present that report to us. So we will turn it over to her and whenever you are ready Assemblywoman, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate you allowing me to go out of order. Um, once again, I'm Leslie Cohen, uh, for the record, um, and I represent Assembly District 29 in Clark County. During the 2019-2020 uh, interim, I served as the chair of the legislature of the Legislative Committee on Healthcare, and I am pleased to provide a summary of the committee's activities to you this morning. Uh, some background information pursuant to NRS. 439B.200, the Legislative Committee on Healthcare oversees a wide range of issues related to access, cost, and quality of healthcare for all Nevadans. During the 2019-2020 interim, the committee held eight meetings, including four virtual meetings. We received public testimony at each meeting and focused on topics related to behavioral health, uh, maternal and child health, oral health, public health and the pandemic caused by the novel coronavirus. During its work session on September 14, 2020, the committee approved eight bill draft requests to be considered by the 2021 session of the legislature. BDR 54-450 takes a step toward addressing the ongoing opioid epidemic by increasing healthcare provider awareness of an evidence-based method of screening for alcohol and drug use. It requires controlled substance prescribers to obtain two hours of continuing education in screening, brief intervention, and uh, referral to treatment, or what's uh, known as SBIRT, as part of licensure or license renewal, and it provides certain exceptions uh, within that realm. Then BDR 38-451 aims to leverage federal Medicaid funds to improve access to inpatient and residential services 
for Medicaid recipients who have substance use disorder by requiring the Department of Health and Human Services to apply for certain Medicaid waivers to allow the state to pay for services in large facilities that traditional, um, larger, excuse me, larger facilities than traditionally are authorized. BDR 40-453 revises requirements related to testing pregnant women for certain sexually transmitted infections in an effort to have high rates of such preventable diseases in the state. In 2018, Nevada had the highest rates of primary and secondary syphilis in the nation and second highest rate of congenital syphilis, according to the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. BDR 38452 propose, proposes various mechanisms to expand Medicaid coverage for pregnant women in an effort to improve maternal and child health outcomes in Nevada. BDR 40-455 is a wide ranging proposal related to oral health that aims to enhance access to dental care through teledentistry, establish emergency dental responders, and revise provisions related to the dental loss ratio. BDR 54-455 BDR proposes enacting the Healthcare Workforce Data Collection Analysis and Policy Act to improve available dental uh, data on the healthcare workforce in Nevada. Data will be used to inform health policy planning and workforce development, including health professional shortage area designations and associated funding, which is critical uh, to providing care in medically underserved areas of the state. BDR 38-449 requires Medicaid to re reimburse for community health workers who provide services under the supervision of certain health care providers in an effort to expand health care provider capacity and address the critical shortage of providers in Nevada. And BDR 40-454 is the result of a required study it revises training requirements for unlicensed caregivers who provide care at certain state licensed facilities, homes, and agencies. A detailed summary of the committee's BDRs is available beginning on page 45 of the commission's meeting packet. Additional information regarding each topic is provided in the committee's final report, which is available on NELIS. Uh, in closing, despite the challenging circumstances of the past year, the Legislative Committee on Healthcare considered numerous issues affecting the health and well-being of Nevadans. While the fiscal and economic consequences of the pandemic required revising our priorities and rethinking which policies to pursue, I'm proud of the work of the committee completed and the proposals we ultimately chose to move forward. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that we received numerous worthy recommendations that the committee likely would have taken up if uh, the fiscal situation of the state were different. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank um, the public for their participation in the process and for sharing their stories and policy recommendation. And of course, um, our HHS staff and LCB staff. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you, Assemblywoman. We appreciate um, not only your hard work during this interim in addressing some important issues, but also your presentation today. Anyone on the commission have any questions for Assemblywoman Cohen? And I am not seeing any. Um, so again, thank you, Assemblywoman Cohen. We are going to go ahead and move on. Uh, we did have one other request to call another item um, on our report list out of order that is the Committee on Senior Citizens, Veterans and Adults with Special Needs. And I believe we have Senator Spearman who will be joining us to present the report from that interim committee. So Senator Spearman, whenever you are ready, please proceed. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and hoping everyone is doing well today. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you for obliging to take this um, out of order. Uh, and I will apologize now if, if I cough and have to, to mute. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, for the record. <clears throat> I am Pat Spearman, representing Senate District 1 in Clark County. Today I'm here as the chair of the Legislative Committee on Senior Citizens, Veterans, and Adults with Special Needs for the 2019 2020 interim to provide an overview of the work we did in the committee.
the Legislative Committee on Senior Citizens, Veterans, and Adults with Special Needs is a permanent committee of the Nevada Legislature <clears throat> that was established just over a decade ago. <clears throat> the committee is comprised of six legislators, Assemblywoman Bill Bray Axelrod served as Vice Chair and Senator Hardy and Woodhouse Assemblyman Ellison and Assemblywoman Corlo served as members. The committee is required to review, study, and comment on issues relating to senior citizens, veterans, and adults with special needs, including health and human services, elder abuse and exploitation, financial and physical wellness initiatives, housing and transportation, and public outreach and advocacy. In addition, the committee is required to review reports from the Purchasing Division and the State Public Works Division, both from the Department of Administration concerning the number and dollar amount of contracts awarded to certain local veteran-owned businesses. Although we requested a report from the Purchasing Division, they did not send one and staff made several phone calls uh, to try to see if we could get one, but those yielded <clears throat> negative results. So the public works report can be found on our committee's webpage along with the committee's final report. Madam Chair, if I might say this, that one of the things that um, was pretty challenging is getting information from um, several of the agencies uh, and the people when we request um, a report, I'm not sure they understand why we need that uh, to fill out the whole picture. So if there's anything that we can do moving forward um, that makes it abundantly clear that it's not optional, that would be greatly appreciated. The committee <clears throat> is generally budgeted to meet four times during the interim. However, given the events of 2020, we were only able to hold three of these meetings. During these meetings, we tackled several issues relating to seniors and adults with special needs that became heightened in response to the coronavirus disease of 2019 pandemic, including senior isolation and neglect, the, house, <clears throat> the housing challenges facing seniors living independently in the community, nutrition services, sign language, interpreter standards, home community-based services, mental health services, and social interaction and mobility services. We also developed an entire meeting to, devoted one of the entire meetings to the topics concerning veterans. And some of those topics include veterans benefits, transition assistance programs, educational benefits and programs, and the barriers of employment faced by spouses of active duty service members of the United States Armed Forces. Here are the recommendations that were adopted by the committee. <clears throat> At our final meeting and work session on September 1, 2020, the committee considered a total of 14 proposed actions for legislation, letters, or statements to include in its final report. The recommendations for these actions were a result of testimony and presentations provided before the committee and from various advocates and stakeholders throughout the state. These recommendations address important issues from enacting protection <clears throat> orders for vulnerable adults to include a position statement in the committee's final report calling on Congress to provide additional funding for US Postal Service so that senior citizens veterans and adults with special needs do not face delivery delays of their prescription medications because of USPS, USPS delays. In the interest of time, I'll quickly summarize the committee's eight bill draft requests, but I encourage you to review the background of these requests in the committee's final report. Number one, require a private employer of fewer than 50 employees that provides sick leave benefits to allow the employees to use such accrued leave for the absence due to illness, energy, injury, medical appointment, 
or other authorized medical need of a member of the employee's immediate family. Two, establish a vulnerable adult protection order. <clears throat> Excuse me, establish a vulnerable adult protection order to protect vulnerable adults against abuse, exploitation, or neglect. Three, appropriate state general funds to the adopt a vet dental program. Four, as funds are necessary, I might add, revise provisions related to the education benefits of veterans and their dependents. Revise provisions related to occupational and professional licensing for members of the US Armed Forces, veterans and their spouses. Six, express support for the federal government to create a retirement plan for military spouses. Seven, require Medicaid to cover certain services <clears throat> of people with a cognitive impairment, including Alzheimer's disease. And eight, update the requirements and qualifications for sign language interpreters to align with national standards and recommended practices. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I just wanna comment on <clears throat> a couple of those, the retirement system that we're asking our federal delegation uh, to implement. Um, is because as we hear from veteran spouses, um, our servicemen and women can't decide where they're gonna be stationed or how long they're gonna be stationed there. And spouses who have professional licenses um, never have an opportunity to get vested in a retirement program. And after <clears throat> a lot of discussion, we determined that it would probably be best if it were done at the national level because each state has their own public employee benefit system and doing it at the national level would make it equal <clears throat> across the board uh, for all spouses. So with that, thank you, Madam Chair. These recommendations for legislative repre <clears throat> represent considerable work by the committee this interim. And I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these important measures, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator, and it is so good to see you on the mend and, and to have you here with all of us. We're really grateful um, that you are still here to keep doing the good work, so thank you. Um, any questions from members of the commission for the um, for the commission, or excuse me, for the committee report uh, presented just now by Senator Spearman? And I am not seeing any. So thank you again, Senator Spearman. Um, and uh, be well, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone be well. Have a great weekend. Okay. We are going to move back to our agenda um, and start with the with the first committee report that we have on our list, the Advisory Commission on the Administration of Justice. And um, who will be presenting this report for the Advisory Commission on the Administration of Justice? Um, Madam Chair, this is Kathleen Norris from LCB Legal, and I'll be presenting on behalf of Chair Wynn, if that's all right with you. Fantastic. Um, welcome, and please proceed. Thanks. Um, again, my name is Kathleen Norris. I'm pre presenting on behalf of Chair Wynn for the Advisory Commission on the Administration of Justice. Um, this committee was vice chaired by Senator Scheibel and Senator Pickard and Assemblywoman Krasner also sat on the committee along with 14 other members from all corners of the criminal justice system. With the exception of criminal sentencing, which is handled by the Sentencing Commission, um, state law directs the advisory commission to ev evaluate and study elements of the criminal justice system in this state. There's also one statutory committee housed under this um, the advisory commission known as the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice Information Sharing. Over the course of the interim, the ACAJ held three full committee meetings and one work session, with most of the meetings occurring virtually during the pandemic. The Subcommittee on Criminal Justice Information Sharing also met one time virtually and was chaired by Mindy McKay of the Records, Communication and Compliance Division of the Department of Public Safety. Even under these unusual circumstances in the pandemic, the ACAJ was able to receive extensive testimony from national experts, state and local government representatives, 
and local criminal justice practitioners in the state. The ACAJ covered topics that included presentations on duties, caseloads, and legislative changes, as well as staffing and budgetary issues from the administrative office of the courts, the parole board, the division of parole and probation, as well as the division of records, communication, and compliance. The ACAJ also received an overview on AB 236 as it relates to controlled substances and other possible technical changes to technical changes to the legislation enacted last session. Um, the committee also received presentations on the national legislative trends related to controlled substances, as well as received presentations from Attorney General Ford related to his justice and injustice panels. Finally, the um, ACAJ received a presentation on the Nevada Criminal Justice Information System, also known as NCGIS, and its modernization efforts. At the work session, the ACAJ considered a total of 18 recommendations, approving 12 of those recommendations. As many of you may be aware, the ACAJ does not receive any BDRs allocated by statute. So to enact legislation, um, these recommendations will be have to, have to be carried by individual legislatures, legislators or committee chairs. So I'm gonna briefly go over um, the robust recommendations made by the ACAJ. Um, in terms of legislation, there are eight recommendations. The first being to draft legislation on the production of standardized pre-sentence investigation reports by the Division of Parole and Probation. Secondly, to draft legislation to repeal provisions requiring the Division of Parole and Probation to make certain sentencing recommendations. Third was changes to certain technical term references in the NRS, for instance, changing the terms intensive, close, sh or strict supervision to enhance supervision for the purposes of the risk, risk assessment tool used by the Division of Parole and Probation. Fourth, to draft legislation to repeal the probable cause inquiries currently being conducted by the Division of Parole and Probation. Fifth, to remove certain conflicts between res um, sentencing to residential confinement and the graduated sanctions that have been adopted by the Division of Parole and Probation pursuant to AB 236 in 2019. Sixth, to statutorily bifurcate certain processes related to parole and probation respectively. Seventh, to revise certain penalties for offenses related to control substances that arose out of some technical issues with AB 236 in 2019. And finally, to revise the definition of record of criminal history to include misdemeanor vehicular manslaughter. So that would be a retainable record of criminal history. Um, the ACAJ also voted to approve the drafting of one letter, which will be sent to the governor and the legislature, urging support for the funding of the Nevada criminal justice information system modernization effort to the tune of $40 million. This um, is a looming ex budgetary item that will cause problems with criminal justice information sharing if funding is not provided for the system. And finally, the ACAJ voted to draft three policy statements, which will be included in its final report. The first being to encourage information sharing for specialty courts, specifically as related to recidivism of offenders in those programs. Secondly, to um, urge the development of a technical specification to be used by all systems of criminal justice information sharing in the state. And third, a statement to encourage the state's use of 12 new criminal disposition codes for information sharing in this state. And Madam Chair, that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone from the commission have any questions on the report from the Advisory Commission on the Administration of Justice? I am not seeing any. So thank you again for being here with us and for that wonderful presentation. Um, we are going to move to the next report on our agenda, which is from the Committee on Child Welfare and Juvenile Justice. I believe we should have um, Assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno, who will be walking us through this report. Um, Assemblywoman, whenever you are ready, please proceed. Good morning. And for the record, Madam Chair, I am Assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno. I represent Assembly District 1. 
This interim, I served as the vice chair of the Legislative Commission Committee on Child Welfare and Juvenile Justice. Our chair, Senator Orenshaw, is unfortunately unable to join us today and has asked that I present his report. First, I would like to thank the members of this body for granting the committee an extension to complete our work in October. Past the regular September deadline for interim committees to wrap up. As we are all well aware, the COVID-19 pandemic and attendant budgetary issues the legislature had to address in special session made it very challenging for the Child Welfare and Juvenile Justice Committee to hold its meetings and gather information for the studies we were have to conduct. The extra time we were granted made all the difference, so thank you. Now, on to the work of the committee. In addition to our regular workload, we were assigned three separate interim studies. Assembly Bill 111 directed the committee to conduct or to contract with an outside entity to conduct a study on how best to maximize federal funding opportunities for the state's child welfare system. The Council of State Governments, also known as CSG, was awarded the contract and completed the study on time. Briefly, the study did not recommend any statutory changes, but it did find many areas where both state and local child welfare, welfare providers can improve efficiencies and seek to enhance existing funding streams. The committee approved CSG's final report unanimously and has communi communicated its support for the findings therein to all the appropriate entities. We will monitor related developments and any possible budgetary requests made in response to these findings and act according during the upcoming session. Assembly Bill 430 required the committee to review the success and potential for expansion of Nevada's maternal, infant, and early childhood home visitation programs. The committee was pleased to learn that the state has robust and well-operated programs, and we did not find any reason to suggest statutory changes at this time. Unfortunately, however, the program currently relies entirely on federal funding for its existence. As such, the committee recommends that the state seeks ways to expand these programs with financial support as quickly as possible. Assembly Bill 449 tasked the committee with studying the housing of juvenile offenders in Nevada to include virtually every element of programming available to these youth while in state custody. The study also took into consideration the relatively small number of youth who are tried as adults in Nevada and are housed either at the Lovelock Correctional Center for Males or, as we were distressed to learn, at out-of-state facilities in the cases of females. The COVID-19 pandemic made conducting this study extremely and especially difficult as committee members and staff were unable to visit any institutions during the interim or speak to the youth or various administrators on site at our institutions. We also learned that some of the data we were seeking to gather was either not available or was embedded in other data sets, making some findings difficult to ascertain. For these reasons, the committee voted to introduce several pieces of legislation intended to further the goals of the study and to ensure that juvenile justice reform remains a topic of concern to the full legislature during the 2021 session. In addition to these studies, the committee received reports regarding improving assistance for our extended foster care population for AB um, 150, preventing the commercial sex, sexual exploitation of children, also known as CSEC, and developing improved care and support systems for CSEC victims per Senate Bill 293. In reviewing the implementation of Assembly Bills 99 and 180 of the 2017 session, especially as relates to the services and programming being provided to our LGBTQ plus youth in our out of home care system. 
Improvements and initiatives related to each of these subjects are ongoing. And the committee both requested legislation and approved letters supporting certain suggestions or requesting further information as we deemed appropriate. This was a challenging interim, Madam Chair, and I would like to thank those who assisted us with our work, as well as my fellow committee members and staff for helping us not only get through it, but also to develop 23 recommendations that resulted in 10 BDRs and multiple letters to entities across the state that made very clear the committee's engagement and ongoing desire to continue improving our child welfare and juvenile justice system at every opportunity. I invite members to review our community bulletin and reach out to Senator Orange or any of the committee members with any questions you have in the future or during the next upcoming legislative session. And with that, that ends the presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman, as always. Good to see you and have you here at Legislative Commission. Um, any questions from members of the commission for Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno? And I am not seeing any, so thank you. I think we've got you back in a bit for a couple more presentations. Sounds like we're gonna keep you pretty busy. Um, we'll move on to our next one in the, in the meantime, and that is the Committee on Education. And we do have Senator Dennis here to go ahead and present that report. Uh, Senator Dennis, whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, and thank you members of the commission for this opportunity. Um, for the record, I am Senator Mo Dennis representing Senate District 2. Uh, presenting today in my capacity as vice chair of the Legislative Commission on our Committee on Education. Um, our chair, Brittany Miller, did a, an amazing job. Uh, considering all the challenges that we had, uh, we were able to get through all the things that we need to. Uh, but um, she is unable un to be with us this morning, so I, I am I'm stepping up and uh, doing the, the presentation for us today. Uh, the committee met seven times during the 2019-2020 interim. Our focus covered three main um, areas. Uh, first, the oversight of new programs and policies implemented by the 2019 legislature. Second, monitoring and reviewing education policy in pre-kindergarten through higher ed in the state generally. And three, responses to COVID-19 at the state and local levels. As part of this work, the committee received periodic updates from the Commission on School Funding as required by Senate Bill 543. We also appointed members to the Teacher Recruitment and Retention Task Force and received recommendations from that body as required by Assembly Bill 276. The committee reviewed and provided feedback concerning the initial plan to manage the growth of uh, charter schools uh, developed by the State Public Charter School Authority in compliance with Assembly Bill 462. We reviewed the feedback of a working group on student safety and well being as required by Senate Bill 332. Finally, the members considered the findings of the study of the impact and validity of the statewide performance evaluation system for education employees pursuant to Senate Bill 475. Uh, during our final meeting and work session, the committee approved six proposals for legislation to be considered by the 81st session of the uh, Nevada legislature and another 18 proposals for issuing correspondence or including position statements in our final report. Uh, topics of the bill draft requests include educational personnel, testing of pupils, charter schools, and the transportation of pupils. I will provide a bit more background on those proposed bill drafts ultimately selected by the committee to move forward for the upcoming session. First, the members voted to propose legislation to direct Nevada's Department of Education to develop, implement, and analyze the results of statewide educator exit surveys in consultation with the Nevada State Teacher Recruitment and Retention Task Force. The proposal encourages the department to utilize external partners to assist in this process. Furthermore, uh, school districts will be required to collect and report exit survey information to the department, which will review school district exit surveys, information, uh, survey information, and make recommendations for improvement to the school districts. This information, along with any recommendations uh, proposed for school districts, and for changes in statute will be forwarded to the 2021-22 Interim Legislative Committee on Education. Next, the committee voted to propose legislation to revise NRS 388A.518 uh, 
and any other relevant statutes to modify licensing and other qualifications for certain uh, personnel employed by a charter school, including requiring charter schools to employ licensed teachers. Any person currently teaching in a charter school who does not meet those pro proposed qualifications would be allowed to continue teaching for up to five years while obtaining the necessary qualification. The, the committee spent a good deal of time deliberating the value of student assessments in this interim. While we continue to discuss the impacts of assessments on, on students, the members felt the upcoming school year may present unique challenges to the measurement of student achievement. That is why the committee voted to propose legislation to provide that the requirement to administer certain uh, assessments under both the Federal Every Student Succeed Acts and state law be waived to the extent granted um, by the federal government. Furthermore, the committee voted to propose legislation to require the Department of Education to review the educational value of assessments, the cost of assessments, and redundancy in similar information being measured by different assessments. The, the bill would also require the department to adopt by regulation appropriate limitations on assessments, including but not limited to one, the actual instructional, instructional time lost by students due to the administration of certain assessments, and two, the number of tests administered. If a school district wants to exceed the recommended, recommended limits, the school district must request a waiver from the State Board of Education to exceed such limits. The fifth bill draft concerns an educational management organization operating in this state. The committee voted to propose legislation to require governing bodies of each charter school in Nevada that contracts with an educational management organization to report to the State Public Charter School Authority, the SPCSA, by November 1st of each numbered year, the amount paid to the management organization. Finally, at the request of the Department of Education, the committee voted to propose legislation to revise NRS 386.830 to require Nevada's Department of Public Safety to provide written notice to violations discovered during semi-annual school bus inspections to the superintendent of a school district or his or her designee, which the vehicle operates. Further, the proposal would require DPS to provide an annual report detailing the inspections and related recommendations to ensure the health of the school bus fleet to each district superintendent or the head of each charter school. Madam Chair, this concludes my presentation on the activities of the Legislative Commission on Education for the 2019-20 interim. Uh, and if you or the public would like to review the activities and recommendations of the committee in more detail, I encourage you uh, to access the committee's final brief on the committee's webpage. And uh, uh, it was an uh, um, uh, interesting um, interim for us, and we weren't able to do our typical um, tours of schools and meet with students. And, um, but I think there were some really important things that were discussed, and I think this legislation coming forward is going to help make education better. Um, and um, that's all I have, and I am happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. Thank you, Senator Dennis, and of course, thank you for always being such an amazing advocate for education here in the state. Um, any questions from members of the commission on the report from the Committee on Education? I am not seeing any, so thank you, Senator. Um, we will move on to our next item on our agenda, and I believe uh, we will be welcoming back Assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno for the presentation from the Committee on Energy. Assemblywoman, when you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am Assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno, representing Assembly District 1. This interim period, I had the honor of serving as chair of the Legislative Committee on Energy, which is a permanent committee of the legislature. The committee is charged with evaluating, reviewing, and commenting upon energy policy pursuant to NRS 218E.815. The committee is comprised of six legislators, Senator Brooks served as vice chair, Senators Hammond and Spearman and Assemblywomen Peters and Tolls served as members. The committee met four times this interim period and had robust discussions on a variety of issues and programs pertaining to renewable energy, clean energy resources and transportation funding. At our final meeting and work session on September 16, 2020, we considered a total of five proposed actions for letters statements to be introduced in the report and legislation. 
Today, I would like to give a brief summary of these actions, which cover the following issues. One, an integrated Western energy market. Two, educating and training the workforce and renewable energy industries related to mining. Three, geological mapping and four, transportation funding. In addition to information on our discussion, the Energy Committee's final report is on the legislative website. First, the committee unanimously voted to send letters to the Governor of Nevada, the Governor's Office of Energy, the Public Utilities Commission of Nevada, and Envy Energy supporting an integrated Western energy market. We received testimony that the benefits of an integrated Western energy market include lower emissions of greenhouse gases, lower energy prices, and improved grid efficiency. Second, in Nevada, we can continue to develop and expand the current and future technical workforce in renewable energy and related mining industry, including geothermal and lithium. It was noted that skilled energy and mining jobs at all levels require a strong foundation in science, technology, engineering, and math, better known as STEM. Based on this information, we voted to send letters to the Nevada System of Higher Education, Nevada's Department of Education, and the Department of Employment, Training, and Rehabilitation, encouraging them to continue working with the mining industry to improve education, communication, and interest in mining and related fields in grades K through 12, undergraduate, graduate, and continuing education. The communication between educators and industry will result in the type of skills and attributes necessary for Nevada students to work in all aspects of the mining industry. Next, Nevada's Bureau of Mines and Geology, University of Nevada, Reno, provided an overview of statewide light detection and ranging, otherwise known as LIDAR data, which is a high resolution typographic data that provides critical information on the distribution of faults and rock layers that host renewable energy resources. The LIDAR system allows scientists and mapping professionals to examine both natural and man-made environments with accuracy, precision, and flexibility. Applications in Nevada include fault patterns related to geothermal resources, lithium exploration, and solar and wind farming siting. We heard that there is a lack of current high resolution LIDAR mapping coverage in our state. And there are barriers associated with further mapping for the state due to the large amount of public land, well as obtaining funding for LIDAR outside of the urban areas. Therefore, we included a statement in the final report encouraging governmental agencies such as the United States Geological Survey of the US Department of the Interior and the US Department of Energy to allocate additional funds to be used in Nevada to increase statewide LIDAR data. Finally, pursuant to Senate Concurrent Resolution 3 of the 2019 session, the committee was tasked with considering alternative solutions to transportation system funding in Nevada. The benefits of using electric vehicles and the cost of transportation related pollutions, including greenhouse gas emissions. Based on presentations and testimony, the committee requested two bill drafts. The first BDR is 458 requires the Nevada Department of Transportation to establish a working group beginning in July 2021 and ending in December 2022 to collect and monitor data and develop preliminary plans for a sustainable transportation funding system. At our August meeting, NDOT indicated it would be prudent to work with the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and GOE to bring together and educate individuals, communities, and organizations from across the state to ensure the scope of the transportation funding issue is understood and the options and solutions they pursue are properly analyzed, vetted, and shared with the broader community. The BDR sets out the scope of the study and the members of the working group. The committee also requested a second BDR, BDR C-459, directed at the challenges associated with funding urban transit, specifically construction and maintenance of the system. 
currently under Article 9, Section 5 of the Nevada Constitution, the proceeds of the imposition of any license or reg registration fee or other charges with respect to the operation of any motor vehicle on any public highway in Nevada and the proceeds from the imposition of any excise tax on gasoline and other motor vehicle fuel must accept the exempt the cost of administration to be used exclusively for the construction, maintenance, operation, and repair of public highways. The BDR proposes to amend the use of the aforementioned proceeds by the Nevada Constitution to include transit and transit infrastructure. And that would conclude this um, report, but I would like to thank our staff who worked with us during this interim, during the challenges of um, COVID, all the agencies who made themselves available for um, testimony and the public hearings and the public for participating to get the work done. And with that, Madam Chair, that concludes the report and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Um, any questions for Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno? I am not seeing any. Um, but don't go anywhere, Assemblywoman. Our next item on our agenda is the Commission on Special License Plates, um, and we have got you on deck to present that as well. It sounds like we kept you very busy this interim, um, and always, of course, glad to have you here with us for as much time as we can keep you. So whenever you're ready, please um, feel free to go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, it was a busy interim, <laughs> and this is the last time you'll see me today. Um, I am Assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno, and I represent Assembly District 1. This interim, I served as chair of the Commission on Special License Plates. The commission is comprised of five legislators and three non-voting members representing the Department of Motor Vehicles, the Department of Public Safety, the Department of Tourism and Cultural Affairs. Senator Cancella served as vice chair, Senator Washington, Assemblyman McCurdy, and Assemblywoman Tolls were members of the commission. Julie Butler, director of DMV, George Tagliati, director of DPS, and Tony Manfredi, executive director of the Nevada Arts Council of the Department of Tourism and Cultural Affairs served as non-voting members. As background, the commission was established in 2003 by the legislature to review any applications to sponsor a new specialty license plate as defined in NRS 482.367008. The commission makes a recommendation to the DMV regarding whether a plate should be issued and the DMV makes the final determination prior to the commission's establishment special license plate were authorized solely through the legislative action. As of September 30th, 2020, there were 332,683 active special license plates, which have generated approximately 82.7 million in revenue since fiscal year 1998. The most widely issued license plate is the Las Vegas commemorative plate 80,691 active plates, which has generated over 29.4 million in revenue. This interim, the committee, the commission met virtually in September 2020 to consider a few things. First, revising the design of the hot August night special license plate. Two, redirecting revenue generated from the sale and renewal of the Virginia Truckee Railroad special license plate from the treasurer of Story County to the organization, and three, recommending several applications for special license plates to the DMV. The commission recommended approval of the DMV of two special license plates for the first tier. First to the Clark County Public Education Foundation and the second to Opportunity Village, the ARC. In the second tier, we recommended approval for two special license plates, the Neon Museum and the Friends of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police. The commission also recommended the approval of the ultimate fighting championship special license plate if the cap on the number of plates in the second tier falls below five before July 1st, 2021. In addition, the commission also approved the drafting of four bills to forward to the 2021 legislature that address the following topics. 
First, revising the process whereby the DMV suspends a special license plate. Second, submitting artwork for a special license plate. Third, the alphanumeric sequencing of all special license plates. And fourth, transferring the duties and the responsibilities of the commission on special license plate to the DMV. I would first like to discuss revising the process where the DMV suspends special license plates. Currently, the commission may make a determination that a charitable organization receiving revenue from the sale of special license plate is not complying with certain laws governing special license plates. The commission may recommend the DMV suspend the collection of all additional fees collected on behalf of the organization and the production of its special license plate if the DMV is still producing that design. However, there is no mechanism for the DMV in, consult in consultation with the commission to one, change the status of such a suspension license plate to be suspended with condition or two, terminate the special license plate to allow a vacancy in tier one or tier two. BDR 43-473 would allow the DMV to change the status of the suspended license plate to be suspended with conditions or terminate the special license plate. Next, the commission voted unanimously to require an organization to submit its special license plate artwork to the DMV within 180 days of a recommendation by the commission to the DMV to approve its special license plate or a special license plate approved by the legislature and signed by the governor. The DMV noted there have been instances where an organization has allowed several months to lapse between submitting a design for a special license plate and providing feedback to the department's design, which has extended the length of time to produce and circulate special license plates. The commission also voted unanimously to request a bill allowing the DMV to determine alphanumeric character sequencing on all special license plates. Effective July 1st, 2021, all sub sequential passenger vehicles special license plates must hold five positions to include a series of the respected stacked character set and alphanumeric characters and all sequential motorcycle special license plate must hold four positions to include a series of the respective stacked character set and alphanumerical plates. That bill will be BDR 475. The stacked character set allows the DMV to utilize a six character se sequencing set for special specialty plates within a five character space limit. Finally, BDR 43-476 requested by the commission transfers all duties and responsibilities of the commission on special license plates to the DMV since the duties of the commission are repetitive with the functions and responsibilities of DMV. It is noted that the audit duties will remain with the legislature. And with that, um, Madam Chair, that brings us to the conclusion of this report. And again, I would like to thank all of our staff who worked with us, the departments for their hard work during this interim um, to present reports and the public for their public input. Thank you. Um, any questions for Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno from the commission? And I am not seeing any. Um, so again, thank you for spending a good little chunk of your morning with us, Assemblywoman, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move to the next item on our agenda, which is the Committee on Public Lands. And I do believe we have Senator uh, David Parks with us to present that report um, and welcome Senator Parks. It is great to see you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, thank you. Uh, for the record, I am uh, uh, former uh, Senator David Parks. Uh, I had the honor of serving as uh, chair of the statutory uh, uh, committee on public lands during the past interim. Uh, as I'm sure you know, the committee monitors a wide variety of natural resource and public lands matters uh, crucial to the state's economy, lifestyles, and traditions. 
the committee typically travels to rural towns uh, around the state holding committee meetings and conducting informational tours. Uh, these visits uh, uh, provide legislators uh, with the opportunity to visit with local, state, and federal officials and provides uh, members of the committee the ability to hear directly from citizens of each community. Uh, due to the pandemic, the committee held only five of the six committee uh, meetings approved by the Legislative Commission. Uh, we also had to cancel a planned trip to Washington, D.C. Uh, that had been approved through the passage of Assembly Bill 250 uh, from last session. Uh, before the pandemic hit, the committee was able to hold two in-person meetings in Las Vegas and Caliente uh, with plans to attend uh, meetings uh, in uh, Carson City, Eureka, Fallon, and Tonopah. Prior to the shutdown, the committee was able to take a tour in Caliente, uh, which uh, took us to the Kershaw Ryan State Park, the Elgin Schoolhouse State Historic Site, uh, and to the top of the mountain uh, to visit newly built and accessible mountain bike trails along the outer boundary of uh, Kershaw Ryan State Park. While the committee was uh, forced to limit the number of uh, presentations it usually receives, uh, the move uh, to a virtual format still allowed for the review of many significant issues. Some highlights uh, include uh, presentations from uh, the Coalition for Healthy Nevada Lands, Wildlife and Free Roaming Horses, expansion efforts at the Nellis Air Force Base and Fallon Range Training Complexes, uh, updates uh, from the BLM and Forest Service and updates uh, from multiple divisions and programs within the State Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, including the uh, Commission on Off-Highway Vehicles, Environmental Protection, Outdoor Recreation, State Parks, Water Resources, and the Sagebrush Ecosystem Council. Finally, uh, going into uh, the interim, the committee had planned to emphasize uh, the state's cooperation with Native American tribes uh, throughout Nevada. While many of these plans were derailed, including a potential committee meeting uh, at a tribal facility, uh, we were able to hold virtual meetings with the Reno Sparks Indian Colony, the Las Vegas Paiute Tribe, and members of the Eastern Shoshone Paiute Tribe. Uh, at our final uh, meeting uh, and work session in September, uh, the committee considered a total of 17 proposed actions, which resulted in recommending 10 BDRs, six letters, and one policy statement. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I'll briefly uh, review uh, the committee's uh, recommended BDRs. Uh, our first uh, recommendation came from Assemblyman uh, Howard Watts in response to uh, successful meetings held with Native, Native American tribes throughout the interim. As recommended, uh, the committee voted to draft a bill to appoint one tribal member to serve uh, the, uh, on the uh, Legislative Committee on Public Lands. Uh, next, uh, based on recommendations submitted uh, by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, the committee voted to draft a bill to uh, one, replace the uh, current off-highway vehicle registration system with an annual use decal, two, require out-of-state off-highway vehicle users and vehicles registered for street use and modified for off-road riding to acquire an annual sticker, and three, require all off-highway uh, vehicle users under 16 years of age to wear a helmet on all types of off-highway vehicles. Uh, our third BDR is based on a recommendation from the Eureka County Board of Commissioners, which provides exemption uh, to the open meeting law to allow local governments to engage in deliberative and pre-decisional non-public meetings with federal agencies concerning matters related solely to the National Environmental Protection Act. Uh, B 
BDR number four concerns testimony provided by tribal members in Eastern Nevada regarding the protection of certain locations and populations of swamp, swamp cedars in Spring Valley. Testimony indicated the site uh, and the trees have unique characteristics as well as historical significance to Native American tribes in the region. Tribal members also testified that the area is vital uh, to their ceremonial, cultural, and spiritual heritage. In an effort to uh, protect the trees uh, and the site, uh, the committee approved uh, the following two BDRs. Uh, first, uh, to draft a bill listing the Spring Valley, Nevada population of swamp cedar in statute as a protected species uh, of native flora. And second, uh, uh, a BDR to draft a resolution urging the federal government to protect certain portions of Spring Valley identified uh, as having cultural and historic importance to Native American tribes uh, in the region. Uh, the next recommendation as submitted uh, by the Eureka County Board of Commissioners regards the status of lands held by the federal government under the Recreation and Public Purposes uh, Amendment Act of 1988. These are lands uh, owned by the federal government that are leased to public and not-for-profit agencies. In many cases, structures and other improvements such as schools, fairgrounds, and shooting ranges have been constructed uh, by the agencies. However, due to ownership uh, arrangement, it places certain limitations on the activities of the local governments and not-for-profit agencies. Based on this information, the committee voted to draft a resolution supporting land sales and transfers of these properties uh, to local governments and nonprofit agencies where they have uh, constructed and operated public and nonprofit uh, facilities. The, com uh, the committee also voted to draft a resolution seeking the transfer of certain federal lands uh, to the state uh, of Nevada for the purpose of supplementing the state's permanent school fund through the addition of school trust lands. According to testimony provided by representatives of the Advocates uh, for School Trust Lands and White Pine County School District, uh, at the time of statehood, Nevada and its neighboring Western states received certain school trust uh, grants. Uh, these lands provided funds uh, for schools th uh, through uh, leases and royalties generated by extraction activities. While some surrounding states receive four sections out of each township map, Nevada only received two sections. Uh, this solution seeks an equitable footing with surrounding states. Based on the information provided by the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, state law requires the state engineer to be licensed, a licensed professional engineer. However, according to testimony, uh, holding a PE as a sole requirement to serve as state engineer has become outdated. While being a licensed uh, PE is still a key professional qualification for the position, other technical expertise is now uh, equally important for the role. Given this information, the committee voted to draft a bill to expand the qualifications for the position of state engineer, uh, to expand the qualifications uh, to include expert, uh, experience and or advanced education in geology, hydrology, water resources, uh, engineering, and water rights. The next BDR, uh, as recommended uh, by the Central Nevada Regional Water Authority, authorizes a Board of County Commissioners to establish a groundwater board for areas designated as groundwater basins by the state engineer. Uh, further, county commissions uh, may appoint members to the groundwater board and a groundwater board uh, may be dissolved by uh, the Board of County Commissioners. Our final uh, BDR uh, is based on a recommendation from the Coalition for Healthy Nevada Lands, Wildlife 
and free roaming horses. A group of uh, conservation organizations, natural resource professionals, and concerned individuals. As recommended, the committee voted unanimously to draft a resolution calling on the US Congress to provide funding to successfully reduce the number of free roaming wild horses and burrows uh, to appropriate management levels using non-lethal means within six years to protect and restore the healthy uh, uh, health and viability of public lands in Nevada. Madam Chair, that concludes my remarks. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the members of the Public Lands Committee for their participation and constructive discussion on the many topics of importance uh, uh, to Nevada. I would also like to thank the LCB staff for their conscientious, conscientious work making our uh, committee's work successful. And finally, I'd like to express uh, uh, my appreciation to the many organizations and agencies that provided presentations and information uh, to the committee. With that, I would be happy to answer any questions uh, uh, you or the uh, uh, commission may have. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Parks. And um, it is always great to see you. And again, thank you for all of your um, hard work, not just during this interim um, on this committee, but over time and in some of these areas um, and your service to the legislature. It's always, always great to have you with us. Um, any questions from members of the commission for Senator Parks? I am not seeing any. So thank you for being here with us, Senator, um, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you, Madam Our Chair. Oh, thank you. Our next committee uh, report is for the Committee for the Review and Oversight of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and the Marlette Lake Water System. And I believe that Senator Ratty is going to be presenting that one. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for the opportunity. We are proud to be the committee with the longest name, the Legislative Committee of the Review and Oversight of the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency and the Marlette Lake Water System. I was pleased to chair this committee and to be joined by Vice Chair Sarah Peterson, Senator Ben Keefer, Senator David Parks, Assemblywoman Sandra Hudegi, and Assemblyman Al Kramer, and have the committee capably staffed by Elisa Keller with the Legislative Council Bureau. I'd also like to express my gratitude to the leadership of the Department of Natural of Conservation and Natural Resources for their good work, to the team over at the Marlette, Marlette Lake Water System to local government and nonprofit stakeholders who leaned in to help us with our work. And of course, the residents who live and love, live at and love the lake who participated in our committee hearings. Uh, we moved forward in a, um, a philosophy of dividing and conquering and giving uh, lots, of, lots of hands make light work. And so I asked uh, Senator, or sorry, Assemblyman Kramer to take the lead on transportation issues Senator Kiekefer to take the lead on economic development issues, and Assemblywoman Peters to take the leads on all things environmental, including forest health, water health, and climate change and its impacts on Lake Tahoe. In the end, the committee came out with a number of recommendations, many of which are resolutions because we're looking for support from other ent entities or the federal government. Um, our first resolution, BDR 364, requests the drafting of a resolution to encourage all of the uh, entities within the ENCHI system to work collaboratively and in coordination to focus their efforts of research on Lake Tahoe. We get amazing work out of uh, many entities, including university system in California. And what we're looking for is perhaps a little bit more coordination and collaboration that could lead from research to practice that would benefit the lake. We also requested a resolution expressing the priority of the timely completion of the Tahoe East Shore Trail and asking Congress to provide federal funding for that completion. Uh, we requested the drafting of a resolution expressing um, support for identifying, identifying key transportation priorities for the Lake Tahoe Basin. In this area, there's uh, been a lot of work. There's a huge understanding across, I think, the board that there are transportation challenges at Lake Tahoe a very unique environment with a lot of entities who are engaged in governance at the lake. 
um, and a two lane road that goes all the way around and some difficulties and growing difficulties for folks to get from point A to point B. Um, there have been some good conversations about what the revenue model might be to help address this issue. But what the committee was looking for was a better sense of what the priorities would be if revenue were to be discovered um, and how that might be spent. So this then directs all of those wonderful agencies that are working around the lake to try to come together and come up with what that list of projects might look like so that if there were to be a future conversation about revenue, that we would have a better understanding of how that revenue might be spent. Um, moving on to our fourth request, uh, this is a bill that uh, many of you will be familiar with that we see every session. It's a necessary piece of legislation to release the next phase of bonds in the amount of $4 million to implement uh, Nevada's portion of the Lake Tahoe Environmental Improvement Program for the 21-23 biennium. We also uh, did the recommendation of a number of letters that are in support of the state agencies who are seeking funding from the federal government and it, it, either through legislative programs through congress or through grant programs and just wanted uh, that staff to have those letters so they could use it in their grant writing efforts with that um that is my full presentation thank you thank you senator um any questions for senator ratty from members of the commission I am not seeing anyone. Uh, so thank you, Senator Rani. We are going to move on to our next item, um, which is the report from the study concerning the cost of prescription drugs. And I do believe that we should be joined by uh, Senator Kinsella. And once we get you connected, Senator, please go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm having some internet issues, so I, I'm not going to turn my video on because I don't want to drop. Um, but I am thrilled to be here and to see all of your faces and really appreciate the hard work the Legislative Commission does. For the record, I am former State Senator Ivana Cancella. Up until last Monday, I represented the 10th Senate District and was very honored to do so. I'm here today to talk about the work of the interim study concerning the cost of prescription drugs and want to say off the top that we worked very hard with the task that we were given because it's an important issue for Nevadans across the state and that I'm grateful for the help of Mr. Patrick Ashton and Mr. Eric Robbins, both of whom helped tremendously to ensure that we have the presentation today. Um, as background, this study was brought about by Senate Bill 276 from last session. We were tasked with three major objectives. The first was to look at the overall cost of prescription drugs in Nevada, including a comparison of those costs with other states. The second was to look at the impact of rebates, price reductions, and other remuneration from manufacturers on the overall cost of prescription drugs in Nevada. And the third was to look at opportunities and options for lowering the cost of prescription drugs to make those drugs more affordable for Nevada residents. We took a lot of input from stakeholders across the board and every meeting began with testimony from patients who are directly affected by the high cost of prescription drugs. And those stories grounded the work of our committee and led to really interesting discussions with a number of entities involved in drug pricing and with entities that have worked on creative solutions at the state level to enhance purchasing power for states and municipalities as they um, take on the task of prescription drugs. And so we've landed on a number of recommendations in the form of five BDRs. The first is a BDR that will establish intra and interstate prescription drug purchasing coalitions. These uh, purchasing coalitions would allow the Department of Health and Human Services to establish these intra and interstate purchasing coalitions and ultimately consolidate purchasing power of agencies and to allow us to 
uh, sorry, to consolidate the purchasing power of agencies in the hopes of being able to negotiate better deals, essentially, for the state of Nevada. This was a model that is being used in other states and has proven to be quite successful. We had folks come in from Washington State to talk to us about this model and uh, their testimony, though they are ahead of where we are, showed that there is a path for how this kind of legislation could positively affect state purchasing power. The second recommendation allows for the licensure of pharmaceutical sales representatives. This would expand on legislation passed in the 2017 session, where as a body, we enacted a law that allows for pharmaceutical sales representatives to be registered in the state as they report their transactions with doctors as part of their course of business. This goes a step farther and would amend chapter 439B to allow for the licensing of pharmaceutical sales reps. The third recommendation is an expansion of drug pricing transparency. This BDR would amend statutes 439B and that's the chapter and statute today that houses the transparency of asthma and diabetes drugs. This would expand that out to a much broader set of prescription drugs in the hopes of looking across the board as we know that when a patient is facing one condition, they are likely facing multiple conditions. Uh, for example, with diabetes, a patient may also be dealing with heart conditions and be taking medication that is not today captured in our transparency laws. This goes farther than what we currently have and allows for a much more holistic data set on the prescription medications that patients take across the board. Uh, it is not dissimilar to transparency legislation that was passed in California about two years ago. The third, uh, sorry, the fourth recommendation looks at another piece of the drug pricing chain and would create regulations for pharmacy benefit managers. Specifically, this bill draft request would require licensing of pharmacy benefit managers by the Department of Health and Human Services. And it would prohibit what is called spread pricing among a number of other things. What we learned as a committee or as an interim study was the importance of addressing issues across the drug pricing chain. And so this bill draft request aims to look specifically at pharmacy benefit managers, as we know, they also play a role in setting the price that patients pay for the medications they need to stay alive. And finally, we put in a fifth bill draft request that allows for the capping of co-pays paid by um, patients when they receive their medications. Uh, as you all know, we looked at, or now know, we looked at options across the drug pricing chain and feel that we have put forward a set of options that will not only help patients, but will also help the state of Nevada as it continues to do drug purchasing, particularly in Medicaid, so that ultimately not only are the costs paid by the state hopefully lowered, but so too are the prices patients pay. And with that, I will answer any questions from you all. Fantastic. And thank you so much for your um, work on, on this interim committee and also on this issue um, in general. It's, it's great to hear from you and, and listen to some of these recommendations. Any questions from members of the commission? And I am not seeing any. Um, so thank you again, uh, Senator. It's great to hear from you and uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing you around soon. Thank you. And thank you for all that you do for the state of Nevada. Thank you.
All right, we're going to move on to our next report, which is from the study concerning wildfires. And I believe that we should have Senator Scheibel with us uh, to present that report. So once we have you connected, please feel free to go ahead. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and as you said, my name is Melanie Scheibel. I represent Senate District 9 in Clark County. And today I'm presenting you the study from the committee to conduct an interim study concerning wildfires. This, uh, the study committee was chaired by our former colleague, Heidi Swank. And as vice chair of the committee, it is my pleasure to provide you with a short overview of the committee's activities during the 2019-2020 interim and the recommendations that resulted from the committee's hard work. The committee to conduct an interim study concerning wildfires was created in 2019 by Assembly Concurrent Resolution 4. And the committee was tasked with considering methods of reducing wildfire fuels, issues related to early responses to wildfires and the economic impact of wildfires on the state and local communities. The, commu the committee consisted of three members of the Senate, three members of the Assembly, and two non-voting members. The committee was budgeted to meet four times over the interim. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the committee only met once in person and three times virtually. At the committee's final meeting and work session on July 2nd of 2020, the committee to conduct an interim study concerning wildfires considered a total of nine proposed actions for legislation or letters. The committee's recommendations were derived from various presentations and testimony and addressed a variety of wildfire related issues. Here's a brief summary of those recommendations which cover the following issues. Wildfire prevention and fuel reduction, wildfire management and costs, wildfire mitigation plans, the wildland urban interface code, and forest health and water quality. I also wanna point out that for additional information on our discussions, the committee's final report is on the legislative website and the committee's abstract and summary of recommendations can be found in your meeting packet starting on page 103. The committee voted unanimously to adopt all of its recommendations, which are as follows. The Wildland Fire Protection Program, Nevada Network of Fire Adapted Communities, Nevada Fire Board of Directors and Insurance Incentives. The committee voted to request legislation, which has been given bill draft number 42-109 to codify and statute Nevada divisions of forestries and wildland fire protection program, the Nevada network of fire adapted communities program and the Nevada fire board of directors. Additionally, the proposed legislation aims to create an incentive program under the commissioner of insurance to encourage insurance related incentives for Nevada homeowners who attain and maintain a fire adapted community status. Next, the committee voted to request legislation which has been given bill draft number 49-108 to authorize the state quarantine officer to classify cheatgrass as a noxious weed. Further, the committee voted to draft a letter to the Bureau of Land Management to encourage the consideration of land swap agreements to reduce hazardous fuel loads in the public private checkerboard landscape of Northern Nevada. Next, the committee voted to draft a letter of support for the Desert Research Institute within the Nevada system of higher education to study the potential use of unmanned aircraft systems as a cost effective resource for wildlife management. Further, the committee voted to draft legislation, which has been given bill draft request number 42-110, authorizing public-private partnerships to enhance investment in wildfire prevention, restoration of infrastructure, and workforce development for enhancing landscape resilience against the threat of wildfires. In addition, the committee voted to draft legislation, which has been given bill draft request number 42-111, authorizing certain governmental entities to recover certain expenses and costs incurred in extinguishing wildfires. Next, the committee voted to draft a letter to Liberty Utilities of California and Nevada Energy to encourage coordinated implementation of their wildfire mitigation plans in the Lake Tahoe Basin. Next, the committee voted to draft a letter to express support for adoption of the Wildland Urban Interface Code by the State Fire Marshal. And lastly, the committee voted to draft a resolution, which has been given BDR uh, number R-112, to recognize that forest health and water quality are inextricably linked and express support for federal, state, and local governments to work with water purveyors and other stakeholders to identify watersheds that can be improved upon by better forest health measures, as well as identify barriers. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to speak about the work done by the committee to conduct a study concerning wildfires during the 2019 to 2020 interim. Thank you to our LCB staff who made all of our meetings possible and helped us to craft these uh, recommendations to the legislature as a whole. And with that, I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator Scheibel. Um, any questions from members of the commission on this report? 
and I am not seeing any. Um, so thank you for being here with us and for walking us through that report um, and for your work during this interim. We are going to go ahead and move on to our next study, which is the study of the issues relating to driving under the influence of marijuana. And I believe that Assemblyman Yeager is here with us to go ahead and present. So whenever you are ready, Assemblyman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, this will be pretty quick. Um, unlike some of the other uh, uh, interim committees, we we really got sidelined by the pandemic and then by the special session. So we just had one meeting uh, back in January to look at this issue. I will tell you, it was a very productive meeting. Uh, one of the things we learned there uh, was that the state of Michigan recently conducted a study about whether they would change their driving under the influence of marijuana uh, laws. And they were very comprehensive. So we were fortunate to have um, a toxicologist from there present to our committee. So we did hear a number of presentations, a number of perspectives, but ultimately uh, we did not have a, a meeting after that. Uh, we didn't do one virtually. So we did not have a work session. Uh, we did not request any of our bill draft requests. I guess the good news there is uh, fewer bill draft requests to consider during session. Uh, I did, however, um, take it upon myself as uh, chair of the Assembly Judiciary Committee to request one committee bill that would deal with one of the topics that we looked at, and that was um, the idea of um, eliminating the per se levels for uh, THC and metabolite that currently uh, exist in our laws. So um, I do have a request for that. And just so um, everybody knows, uh, the BDR number is 485, and that is an Assembly Judiciary Committee bill. Uh, of course, we'll have to go through the process, uh, the legislature of, of vetting that, but um, I think the work that Michigan did uh, was very instructive. So uh, with that being said, Madam Chair, I do want to thank the members for our meeting in January and thank the staff uh, from LCB, as well as our presenters who helped us through this, um, this topic and look forward to work that still lies ahead during the session. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. And sounds like still some good discussions on um, despite the pandemic, which I know um, has made it very difficult for, for frankly all of our committees, um, but we definitely appreciate your work and looking forward to um, talking more about this during the legislative session. Any questions from members of the commission? I am not seeing any, so thank you, Assemblyman. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next item on our agenda, which is our report from the study of issues relating to pretrial release of defendants in criminal cases. And we do have Senator Harris here with us. It's great to see you, Senator. Um, and so whenever you're ready, please feel free to go ahead and proceed. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair. I believe we're still in the morning, 33 minutes uh, ahead of it. Uh, and members of the commission, I'm Senator Dallas Harris representing Senate District 11. And I'm pleased to appear before you today as the chair of the SCR 11 interim study of issues relating to pretrial release of defendants in criminal cases. Uh, that's a, a very long way of saying we studied bail reform issues. I had the distinct pleasure of serving on the SCR 11 committee along with Vice Chair Wynn, Senators Hammond and Scheibel and Assemblyman Flores and Roberts. Together, we held three meetings and a work session during the interim. Um, as has been stated many times, this was uh, only possible because of the, the great work of LCB. We were able to get through our charge. By the way of background, the Nevada Constitution and existing Nevada law require all persons arrested for offenses other than murder of the first degree to be offered the opportunity to be released on bail. Uh, again, you'll often hear the words bail and pretrial release used somewhat interchangeably. Uh, in common parlance. The objectives of Nevada's pretrial system are to ensure one, the safety of the community and two, that defendants appear in court. At the same time, the system must remain mindful of the liberty interests of the defendants who remain innocent until proven guilty. Again, by way of background in March, 2019, the Supreme Court of Nevada issued an order requiring the statewide adoption of the Nevada pretrial risk assessment the NPRA. Then in April 2020, the Supreme Court of Nevada held in Valdez, Valdez Jimenez uh, v. the 8th Judicial District. One, bail set an amount greater than necessary to ensure the defendant's appearance and the safety of the community is unconstitutional. Two, 
an individualized bail hearing must be held within a reasonable time after arrest. And three, heightened due process requirements apply when bail is set in an amount the defendant cannot afford. Given that context and the potential reforms that did not pass last session, the committee's discussion for the interim included one, national trends in bail and pretrial release reform, two, the use and implementation of the NPRA, three, presentations by the judiciary, four, presentations on pretrial jail populations, five, an overview of the lead diversion program, six, presentations on the operation of the bail bond industry, seven, presentations on the Valdez Jimenez case, and eight, uh, by numerous community groups and stakeholders. At the work session, the committee considered 19 recommendations. Ultimately, the committee voted to approve 11 recommendations for the drafting of legislation, four recommendations for the drafting of a letter, and one recommendation for inclusion of a policy statement in the final report. The recommendations for the drafting of legislation have been combined into five statutorily allocated BDRs. To uh, quickly recap those final recommendations, BDR 374 is our omnibus bill, which includes, among other things, it's going to require bail hearings within a reasonable time, returns a defendant back to court within 24 hours if the defendant is unable to meet a condition of release, requires the use of the federal poverty guidelines to determine the ability of a defendant to pay, and provides certain procedural protections. BDR 375 makes changes in line with Valdez to repeal portions of NRS 178.4851 and codify the burden of proof on the state. BDR 376 requires a citation in lieu of arrest for certain non-aggregate offenses, such as traffic, and certain non-violent misdemeanors. BDR 377 authorizes a victim or prosecutor to request a protection order in the pretrial release process, and BDR 378 requires data collection relating to pretrial release. The committee also voted to draft a letter urging the Supreme Court of Nevada to revalidate the NPRA, study racial bias, assess domestic violence, and provide uh, electronic or virtual bail hearings. Finally, the committee voted to include a policy statement in the final report, encouraging education and awareness on issues of domestic and sexual violence. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any of the questions the committee may have. Thank you, Senator Harrison. Thank you for your uh, very, what sounds like thorough work on this issue and looking forward to uh, lots of discussion on it this legislative session. Uh, any questions from members of the commission? Senator Hardy, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. On the recommendation for um, policy statement, does that exist now or is that in the works? That policy statement is in the final report, which I believe is in its last stages. Uh, if you don't have it already, it should be uh, available soon. I've given the, the final sign off on it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, any additional questions from members of the commission? I am not seeing any. Thank you, Senator Harris. It was great to see you. Um, members of the commission, we are going to go ahead and move on to our next item on the agenda, which is the report from the study of requirements for reapportionment and redistricting. I do believe that we are to be joined by Senator Woodhouse, who is right there. Um, it is great to see you. And please, whenever you are ready, go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Legislative Commission. For the record, I am Joyce Woodhouse, former state senator representing Senate District 5, and it was my honor to serve as the chair of the committee to conduct an interim study of the requirements for reapportionment and redistricting in the state of Nevada, which was authorized by Senate Concurrent Resolution 9 of the 2019 legislative session. This resolution was similar to resolutions that the legislature approved in 1989, 1999, and 2009, to conduct interim studies of the requirements for reapportionment and redistricting. The study is held every 10 years in advance of, re of the redistricting session to help us prepare to the, for the redistricting exercise, which essentially is setting the stage for our redistricting efforts in 2021. 
The interim study committee held four meetings in 2020 and as required by SCR 9, heard briefings and presentations on numerous topics and those included the general scope and requirements for reapportionment and redistricting, Census Bureau and Nevada's complete count committee activities and updates and efforts to promote the 2020 decennial census, an, an overview of the legal parameters associated with the reapportionment and redistricting process, a review of available computer technology and geographic information systems mapping capabilities, the use of census geography in redistricting, historical summaries of past reapportionment and redistricting efforts, the impacts of redistricting on election procedures and practices, especially those procedures dealing with ballot preparation, public transportation in redistricting, and the use of election data in the reapportionment and redistricting process. During the study, we heard from a number of individuals, groups, and organizations, including the Legislative Council Bureau staff who provided background and historical data, reports on various legal issues and summaries of GIS functionality. Census Bureau representatives, including state, regional, and federal individuals, representatives from Nevada's Complete Count Committee, the Nevada State Demographer, representatives from the Nevada System of Higher Education, registrars of voters in Clark and Washoe counties, the National Conference of State Legislatures, the state of Utah, and the purpose for that was um, providing public participation in redistricting, which they have been very successful with, and other interested parties and members of the public concerning the 2020 census and various reapportionment and redistricting matters. The four meetings were very productive, very interesting, and extremely informative, and the committee made the following recommendations. One, to purchase autobound redistricting software licenses and the required pa parallel hardware to assist in the legislature's reapportionment and redistricting GIS activities and to establish public workstations to be used during the 2021 redistricting exercise. Two, to hire four session only employees and one is assigned to each caucus who would be based in the research division of the LCB in order to assist with GIS support and provide related technical services during the 2021 redistricting exercise. Three, to authorize the creation of an elections database to assist in reapportionment and redistricting and select four recent competitive statewide elections for inclusion in the GIS database. Four, to recommend joint standing rules for reapportionment and redistricting by the 2021 Nevada legislature which includes the rules adopted for the 2011 redistricting cycle, as well as additional rules that take into account local government boundaries, contests between incumbents when using the approved elections database, and the nesting of assembly districts within Senate districts. And five, to recommend a bill draft request to amend NRS 293.207 to increase from 3,000 to 5,000 the maximum number of active voters permitted in each election precinct. Madam Chair, that concludes my summary of the interim study regarding reapportionment and redistricting. But before I close, I'd like to, I, I know that many of you are wondering about the delays that we have seen already, as well as further expected delays of US Census Bureau data delivery to the states. And of course with Nevada with 120 day session, this creates a problem for us. As you know, we are unable to redraw the lines effectively and legally without official census data. We expect to hear an update from the Census Bureau on January the 27th, at which time we hope to receive an official data delivery schedule. Clearly, these delays will impact our redistricting schedule here in Nevada and how we will handle it is still uncertain. The legislature has the duty and the responsibility to draw congressional and legislative district boundaries, as well as those of the University Board of Regents. If data is not received from the Census Bureau in time, the legislature may need to conduct redistricting during a special session. Obviously, we are still in a wait and see mode for now, and we should know more about Nevada census data by the end of January. 
LCB staff is finalizing the redistricting committee's final report, which will include this new census data when it is received. And that report will be posted soon on the legislative website. So all I can say at this point is stay tuned. Um, I would also encourage you and any listeners to check out the redistricting website, which is easily accessed by going to the legislature's homepage. Finally, I would like to extend my deepest appreciation to the study committee members and especially to our LCB staff for all of the exceptional work that was done on during our four meetings in order to bring you this report. So with that, um, Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. And it's um, always so wonderful to see you. And I know that committee um, has done a lot of work in preparation of getting ready to do redistricting. And I guess we will we will be in the wait and see with you until at least the 27th when hopefully we get some more, some more information. Um, any questions from members of the commission from, for uh, Senator Woodhouse? And I am not seeing any. Um, so thank you again for being here with us and we'll see you soon. The next item on our list um, is the report regarding the study of the feasibility, viability, and design of a public health care insurance plan for Nevadans. Um, and I am going to turn this over to Ms. Erdos. Thank you, Madam Chair. A copy of the report for the study of the feasibility, viability, and design of a public health care insurance plan for Nevada is included in your meeting um, materials, and it's on the web. Um, this study was conducted pursuant to SCR 10 by Minot as the consultant. Um, the LCB contract administrator, Risa Lang, and I have both um, reviewed the report and believe that the report meets all of the requirements set forth in SCR 10 um, and should provide a basis for any implementation legislation desired by the uh, legislature in the 2021 session. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, and that will conclude our items on um, for the reports. Um, and obviously all the commission members have a copy of, um, of those documents. And um, of course, we'll continue to talk about all these items as we move into a legislative session. That brings us to item number seven on our agenda for external auditors communication to the legislative commission. Um, and this is going to be presented by Dan Russian, our LCB Chief Financial Officer. And so I will turn it over to him um, and feel free to go ahead and begin. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, for the record, this is Daniel Russian, Chief Financial Officer of the Legislative Council Bureau. Um, at our last meeting, I presented the LCB's annual financial report, which included the audit report issued by LCB's external audit firm, Ied Bailey. Uh, today we are submitting for the commission's review a letter, a separate letter issued by Ide Bailey that relates to their audit report that includes specific uh, certain communications that are required by the auditing standards. Basically, the purpose of this letter is to communicate to the commission whether any specific issues were noted during the audit that would have not been included or referenced in the audit report itself. I'm pleased to report that this letter does not have any such issues to report. Uh, a copy of the letter has been included in the meeting materials for your reference, and I will now briefly go over uh, the letter's content. Uh, the letter begins by describing the audit firm's responsibilities under the auditing standards to plan and perform the audit and ultimately issue an opinion. It then goes on to state that during the audit, there were no significant unusual transactions noted uh, that the firm would be required to inform the commission of. Uh, the letter then goes on to um, describe some of LCB's significant accounting estimates, which uh, include the pension liability and some other uh, large items that appear on our financial report. Um, and the letter states that there were no difficulties noted during the audit, there were no uncorrected accounting misstatements in the financial statements, and there were no significant disagreements with management during the course of the audit. Uh, the letter also states that uh, during the audit, LCB did not consult with any other CPA firms regarding any audit or accounting matters. If we had, um, the audit firm would be required to inform you of that. Um, and that's primarily the main points of the letter itself. Again, there were no issues uh, that I Bailey uh, was required to report to you uh, during the course of the audit. 
and uh, I'd be happy to answer any specific questions anyone might have at this time. Great, thank you. Um, any questions from members of the commission? And I am not seeing any. So thank you so much for um, presenting us and walking us through that item. We appreciate it. Sure. We are going to move thank on. To, yeah, absolutely. We're going to move on to item number eight, which is a progress report on transmittal of budget to the legis uh, for the Legislative Council Bureau and interim Nevada Legislature to the Office of Finance. And I am again going to turn this over to Ms. Erdos to go ahead and provide this progress report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Item eight is a progress report um, on the transmittal of the budget, uh, the LCB's budget to, to the budget office. You'll likely recall that uh, the commission at its last meeting approved the transmittal of the LCB budget to the state budget office. Um, on the deadline for submitting the budget, uh, we put our budget into NEBS, um, including the 12% reduction as requested. Uh, shortly after that, submission, we were asked uh, by the budget office to uh, submit a budget that had a 6% reduction. So to get to the 6%, we were able to basically just restore the all the positions that we had uh, eliminated. Um, and then we just had to add a little bit of um, additional um, rent reduction for the Las Vegas office to get to the 6%. Um, and I I'm not sure uh, because I haven't done this before whether this is normal, but um, basically I just wanted to let the commission know today that that um, this had occurred and um, I guess we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, questions from the commission, Assemblyman Wheeler, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Hurdles, I was just wondering, the. 12% reduction and the 6% reduction that you're talking about, is that reduction from last year's biennium budget or is that reduction from your requested budget for this year? It's the, um, Assemblyman Wheeler, it is the it is a reduction from our budget from the 2019, that was approved by the 2019 legislature. Okay, thank you. Additional questions, uh, Senator Hardy, please. So is this a good time, uh, Ms. Erdos, to ask, you know, what are we doing with our budget for the next session then in moving people, staying away from people, being semi-close to people? What What is the budget, how's the budget affected by uh, changes that we're making either in the physical plant or in how we do our business? Um, Senator Hardy, thus far, uh, the I believe almost all of the costs, and, and we're not um, we don't have all the the data yet, but so far all of the additional costs um, have been uh, of the of, of you know uh, like updating the HVAC of um, all the extra cleaning supplies. That I think that's what you're asking the the, the uh, automatic doors for the restrooms, those kind of things. Um, have been uh, reimbursed um, through the CARES Act um, because they were all uh, related to COVID and we, um, I shouldn't say we, our accounting unit and, and Dan Russian uh, did an amazing job of um, putting in the request and, and, um, and showing how each one of those related to COVID. And so we did receive um, reduction, I mean, uh, uh, money from the CARES Act, for example, um, which which paid for the most of the of the well all of the the COVID required changes that we implemented um, for that first um, special session, and that's been mostly what we've carried through going forward to this session. In other words, most of the changes to the building um, and things like that, the signage, um, all of that stuff was um, uh, purchased for that first session this summer the 31st and we um, are continuing to add some plexiglass um, and a few things like that so we hope that those will be um, reimbursed through CARES Act money as well. I appreciate it. Will we know how much CARES Act money we use to do all that? We will. Um, I think uh, Dan Russian who you just heard from 
um, we'll be able to provide that information as soon as we, um, I mean, I, I think he has a running total as well, um, but he would also be categorizing that and keeping it um, for us um, at any point when you'd like to, to ask. And then my other uh, observation is we had a lot of meetings canceled uh, from our interim committees. Uh, did we save money and did that money, is that available to do some of the other things that we need to do? I think that um, the money that we saved, I'm thinking on, on travel, like, um, meetings is, canceled. And I'm sorry? Meetings that were canceled, travel that wasn't done. I think that the, the um, best answer to that is that, that the um, budget didn't include a lot of, um, the, a lot of those kinds of expenses are essentially um, just general money is used for that. And I think that um, that might've been spent uh, otherwise. I, I don't know that we have a, um, any kind of large surplus resulting from that. It may have been offset by the other requirements for, um, for doing the work of the studies. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any additional questions from members of the commission? And I'm not seeing any. Um, so thank you, Ms. Erdos. We are going to move to item number nine on our agenda, which is our second period of public comment. Um, if there's anyone who wishes to provide public comment who was not able to do so earlier this meeting, um, please make sure that you call the number that is indicated on our agenda. You will be informed by our staff of the broadcast production services when you've been connected and it is your turn to speak. And again, um, we will limit comments to two minutes. So I'll pop in if you start to go over and ask you to go ahead and wrap up. But of course, we always take additional comments in writing and those can be submitted to us um, even after the meeting to be included in the record. I am now going to turn this over to our BPS staff to queue up those who are calling in to speak and they will let you know when it is your turn to speak. So please pay careful attention. Madam Chair, at this time, the public comment line is open and working. There, there isn't anybody in the queue. Do you want to take a couple of minutes break to allow people to call in? That you let me know what you want to do. Um, yes, let's go ahead and give them just a couple of minutes since we just uh, arrived at our public comment period. And that way, if anyone wishes to join us for public comment, we will get them connected and uh, and go from there. The committee will just be at, or commission will just be at ease.
Madam Chair, at this time, there are no public callers. Then that will conclude item number nine, our public comments, um, our second period of public comments on our agenda. Um, and that also concludes uh, the business before the Legislative Commission at this time. And so seeing no further business, I thank you all for being here with us today. Um, and I think uh, if nothing else today, we've heard a, a giant thank you to every single person um, from LCB and our staff who have helped us to not only navigate um, these legislative commission meetings in the midst of a pandemic, but also a number of very important um, interim committees that have done great work and are going to help us to address some very significant issues this next legislative session. So thank you so much, um, every single one of you for, for all of your help and support. It really does mean a lot and you do fantastic work. So with that, uh, thanks again, everyone. This meeting is adjourned.